speak and try to clarify a few things. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the Coniglia case, which is the case that was referenced by Ms. Muller. Uh, that case was a case involving a um, Fourth Amendment seizure by police officers of a gun. Um, it was ruled 9-0 that there was a Fourth Amendment uh, right by that individual to have that gun and was taken from this home without a search warrant, without, uh, cr without correct due process. And uh, it was not directly a red flag case, but it was a, a, a search and seizure. It turned on Fourth Amendment rights, not Second Amendment rights. But Justice Alito, in his opinion, opined that, quote, I'm going to quote this, provision of red flag laws may be challenged under the Fourth Amendment, close quote. He set the stage for red flag laws being potentially violative of the Fourth Amendment. That is, I think, something that we, everybody in here, should be concerned about. Uh, I wanted to get to something that was in the written statement of, of uh, Mr. Skaggs, and, and I don't think it was alluded to. People talked all around it, but I just wanted to get to this point. It was on uh, page three of your, your, your point, and, and I, I enter it only because I think it's a point of interest because we were talk, you were discussing suicides in here, and we've discussed suicides, and I think you said they were in your written testimony that they were about 60%, and I think... My data indicates it's 56 percent, and I think Ms. Muller testified 55 percent. But nonetheless, uh, suicide by gun is about somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of all uh, gun violence in the country. And uh, but guns are used in only five percent of suicide attempts. But they are just much more effective than other forms of suicide. I, I think we all can acknowledge that. But I, I just wanted to clarify that because I don't think it was clarif clarified in the testimony. Uh, with regard to ghost guns, um, to manufacture a firearm that's intended for sale um, without a federal firearms license is, is already illegal. And that's important to understand and remember. Um, is, so if someone's manufacturing a ghost gun for the purpose of sale, that violates already current federal law. Uh, I, I, I also have a, a number of... of Pieces. I mean, uh, Mr. Gutenberg mentioned that that uh, the original testimony that we saw of Ms. Ms. Hupp was um, um, th there were not 400 million guns in the in, in the United States at the time that she initially made that. And I think that's right. I think it's accurate. But she also testified um, three other times before Congress. Um, so the initial testimony, yes, that's the correct. But she also testified, and I would like to submit. Uh, Two transcripts of her testimony, which contains the same, the essence, in essence, the same testimony she just gave that you saw earlier. Also, uh, a document dated May 11th, 2021, called "In These 11 Cases of Firearm Save the Owner or Others." Another one from April 15th with the same title. Another one from Mar March 10th, saying these 11 examples of a defensive gun use undermine push for more gun control. Another one from February 17th, entitled "11 Times a Gun Stopped Matters from Getting Worse." document um, entitled Undetectable Firearms, um, another one entitled Background Information on So-Called Assault Weapons, another one entitled Another Ban on High Capacity Magazines, another one in, in called That Time the CDC Asked About Defensive Gun Uses, another one uh, entitled Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence. That's a series of, of documents I'd ask that they be admitted to the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, I want to make one last point and then... Um, then I'll, I mean, there's so much to talk about. I, I really am sincerely grateful that everybody came in. I mean, I, and we may differ on getting to it. I think there's some root causes that if we were to let down our partisan guard and our defensiveness, we might be able to, to reach some kind of uh, accord on some things that might work. But, and I, having said that, and, and I would refer people to, to Ms. Muller's written testimony, which does have a series of proposed um, remedies that she, she advocates for. But I, I remind everyone on this committee that just a week ago, our chairman wisely admonished our side from berating witnesses last week. Yet today, Chairman Nadler attacked Ms. Muller um, and uh, in, his, in his, his statement before he got in his questioning 
before he went to ask anybody questions, he berated Ms. Muller. Um, and then I would say that my colleague from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, um, in my opinion, he probably doesn't think so, but I think he misrepresented her view, and then followed up by saying that those points, which I think were misrepresented, were lunacy. We've had one witness to say that arguments that disagreed with his are, quote, BS arguments, close quote. If you really want to get to, to a way to resolve issues, we need to move past this constant discarding of whatever the other side is saying. We, we are divided. There are two sides, but there are probably places of finding accord. Defensiveness and um, ad hominem attacks are not successful. And that's why I thank the, the gentlelady for reminding us last week, and I want to just take the opportunity to remind us a little bit this week on some of the talk, uh, talkers that we heard from, from some of my colleagues on the other side. And with that, Madam Chair, I thank you again for the opportunity to take a moment. I, re I uh, yield back. I thank the ranking member. I wanted to extend to you the courtesies. I would just say for both of us, when members are out of the room, it's probably challenging for me to accept uh, critiques, so they're not here to either respond, but I thank you for your clarification. Uh, I, too, have some uh, concluding uh, qu questions uh, similar uh, to take within my time frame here, but I do want to remind everyone that we came today to discuss the unending crisis and to uh, find essential steps to reduce gun violence and mass shootings. So I have some quick round robin for witnesses um, that I did not get a chance to uh, indicate uh, a question, and I'll be very succinct, and I ask the witnesses to be so. I want to start with Representative uh, Goodwin and to um, just answer the question uh, that the potential of permitless guns, will that, in your opinion, produce more death and more bloodshed? Absolutely, I believe so. And would it make Texas a more dangerous state? I believe so. Thank you for your work, and we appreciate it. With that, I want to introduce into the record um, a, a submission by Moms Demand Action that works very hard that has indicated the number of police associations, the Texas Municipal Police Association, Texas Police Chiefs, licensed to carry instructors, faith leaders who are against this legislation, including Moms and Man Action, that will be submitted into the record very quickly. Pastor Grady, thank you. I'm sure you know many of the pastors in my community. You answered it, but I'd appreciate it if you'd say it again. Your daughter still suffers from wounds that she um, was a victim of during that heinous shooting. Are those wounds including mental challenges? And when I say that, her having to go through again. So these are long lasting impacts when you're a gun violence victim. Pastor Grady? Yes, Congresswoman, that is correct. Uh, those challenges uh, every day, uh, Michelle uh, goes through the, the struggle with the emotional, psychological uh, baggage that came with this horrendous uh, attempt to take her life. And uh, she works through it. Uh, she is an advocate, of course, and uh, she is also. Uh, involved that uh, using her story uh, about uh, overcoming and, and, and being intentional about healing. So yes, the, the, those will be a part of her life and a part of our life uh, forever, I believe. But she's working through it. She's courageous. And uh, she has a great support system here in place as well as the other uh, survivors of this uh, horrendous crime that took place in our city. Thank you so very much. So the pain of those families who've lost a loved one and then the pain of those families who are now taking care of a victim who is resilient but still has this impact. Uh, Mr. Skaggs, yes. if I might, thank you so very much, Pastor Grady. If I might, uh, I've been doing this for 27 years longer because I offered the first gun ordinance in the city of Houston that was ever passed and that was holding parents responsible for not storing their guns uh, and generating the loss of little ones in the home. Uh, can you uh, present for me legally the Second Amendment and its ability to stand alongside of those of us who are advocates for gun safety? Are we arguing against the Second Amendment when we argue against uh, ghost guns, argue for storage, argue for background checks, argue for banning assault weapons? Is the Second Amendment compatible with gun safety? 
I very much believe that it is. Uh, in the 2008 decision, it's District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, the court made clear that while the Second Amendment protects an individual right, it's not an absolute or unlimited right. It doesn't uh, extend a right to carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatever purpose. Uh, and the decision specifically made clear uh, with regard to storage that nothing in the Second Amendment uh, is in conflict with laws that prevent child accidents by requiring guns to be stored. That's in the Heller decision itself. It said a wide variety of additional laws were also fully constitutional and fully permissible. And so what we at Giffords are trying to do is find the evidence-based solutions that will both save lives, that the evidence shows us will save lives, and are also fully consistent with the right to keep and bear arms. Um, I think, uh there are many articles consistent with that, and I would assume you would also add extreme risk orders are likewise not contrary to the Second Amendment. I understand, not understand, working with my local law enforcement, uh, they are heavily um, concerned about individuals' conditions, with certain conditions, having guns. Is yeah. that inconsistent? That is not inconsistent. Thank you. Let me submit into the record um, a study by John Hopkins that found strong support among gun owners and non-gun owners for more than 20 uh, gun violence prevention policies, including extreme risk orders, uh, protection orders. I will submit that into the record without objection. Uh, and then I want to take note of a renowned expert, David Hemingway, uh, not the Hemingway, but David Hemingway, that noted uh, rather than rely on the blame game, the public health approach to reducing gun violence seeks to bring people and institutions together to get to work on the problem. It invites everyone to join the effort as part of the solution. My ranking member made that in his final remarks, and then I'm looking for us to be able to join together, maybe on the storage bill uh, or other bills that might be helpful. But the scientific evidence indicates that all other things equal, places with stronger firearm laws have fewer gun problems and suffer fewer violent deaths than places with weaker laws. Let me conclude with you, Mr. Guttenberg, and let me indicate that your member, who's been so much a champion, um, had rain, uh, rain delay, uh, and that is, of course, um, Mr. Deutsch, who is a member of this committee, and he, he sends his uh, best wishes by way of uh, his staff. I want that to be noted on the record. But um, you suffered an unspeakable pain uh, Congresswoman McBath as well, children being lost, another child dealing with it but living his full life. Uh, how do you speak to those who would suggest that your pain and advocacy is anti-police, that you are a defund the police advocate, uh, and that you cannot see the value of good policing, good police conduct? Uh, and I know there were some uh, there are long issues that we could talk about, about response and, and schools, but, but I want you to talk about your pain as we conclude this hearing and that you find, I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, that your work is not inconsistent uh, with your ability to work with good policing, good police conduct, uh, and, and support uh, the idea of protect and serve, uh, but also uh, want to ensure that we end the proliferation of guns and bloodshed on the streets of America. Thank you so much for asking me that. Anyone who follows my story knows I am actually very connected to law enforcement and our first responder community. Um, anyone who follows my story knows my brother died, as have many first responders, because of his service in 9-11. Anyone who follows my story has heard me talk about the law enforcement officers who have been and continue to be a part of my life. I'll answer your question really simply. Gun safety is police safety. If we do more to deal with the reality of the guns and gun violence, we will save the lives of law enforcement. We will, we will save the lives of the members of our community. The less at risk people feel, the less there's gonna be a risk of gun violence. You know, it gets back to, I think the earlier question you were also asking on, on extreme risk protection orders, law enforcement really appreciates them for a reason, because it does help them take weapons from those who intend harm to others. Had extreme risk protection orders been in place before the Parkland shooting, it is likely that shooting never would have 
happen. It is the reason we passed it in Florida three weeks after Parkland. So what I would say to anyone who would suggest that because I believe in gun safety, that I have some aversion to law enforcement, I would simply argue I actually care more about their lives than you do. We care about the experiences that you've had as well. As I close this hearing, uh, we have many views in America, people who believe that police should be reimagined, and I respect them all, and funds should be used to help end violence and promote community groups. Uh, that does not suggest that uh, they are defunding, they are imagining and reimagining. We have all voices in this room, but today's hearing was about ending the crisis, senseless crisis of gun violence. And that's what I hope we have garnered, and we will look at everyone's testimony and find common ground. And I hope my ranking member will take his own words, which is uh, to find a way that we can work together. I thank all the members that were kind enough to stay, and I thank all the witnesses that have presented us with an excellent record uh, that we can proceed on. I think the real question now is for us to get the job done. Thank you so very much, uh, and this meeting is adjourned.